Hello, and you are listening to the Book Was Better podcast, the podcast where we talk about the book of the film. I'm Luke. I'm Courtney. And this week we're talking about Black the Black Hole. Hey, you. Great to have you back for a whole new year as we explore 1979 Disney film The Black Hole. Yeah, we'll go probing around in some black holes. The good in that black hole. <laughs> uh, this is my first of the year. And, it is. Uh, it really felt like homework. Good lord. Yes. Uh, uh, if you haven't heard of this film, it's because it hasn't really had a legacy. It's not a Disney film that's remembered fondly, even though they did put a lot of effort and money into this thing. It cost twice as much as A New Hope did. Yeah. So 1979, two years after A New Hope, certainly has some Star Wars influences, particularly in in the robots department. Mm. Yes. But they spent twice as much, and I reckon they got about uh, a tenth of the film out of that money. Yeah. Let it never be said that money equals success. It it doesn't always. Or happiness. As well, uh, I don't know. That's that's argue. I think just people don't have enough imagination, frankly. I would buy myself some happiness in fifteen minute increments. <laughs> so uh, this really is a big old black hole of entertainment, isn't it? Pretty much, and I I appreciate what you do for this show now because I had to do all the notes and stuff all by myself. Well, you know, that's the manly thing to do. You had to grow up and take responsibility. Yes. And uh, you, look, you've been around the show for quite a while. One of the first people to come on board when Jessica left. Yeah, one uh, of the next generation cast members. To have that very uh, selfish child thing that she wanted to do. <laughs> wanted to uh, breed a, a little hairy Sasquatch creature. He's quite cute, actually. Oh, he's all right. (laughs) So uh, that happened. You've been around for a long time, but let's pull back the curtain for a little bit. We're going to pull back uh, the curtain. We're going to look at the wizard. Mm. We're going to look at the wizard making sausages (laughs) behind the curtain. Is that what he was doing? I think so, yeah. I haven't haven't seen it in a while. That's how the sausage is made, (laughs) by a wizard behind a curtain. (laughs) That's why everybody's... I don't know quite what's in this sausage. Anyway, not always do we have the opportunity to both read the book, and that's because uh, the majority of these books that we get are hard copy books. Mm. And while it might seem, because we're all so close, that we live in a big communal house, it's just not true. So, oh, I saw a house for sale just down the road, so oh, maybe. <laughs> that's what the Patreon money is going for. Yeah. It's going to be a deposit. So instead, uh, what generally happens is I read the book. If it's an e-book, the guest will tend to read it as well. We'll usually both watch the film. But yeah, quite often only one of us reads the book and writes the excerpts. And this time you said, I can do it. I can do it, Luke. Have faith in me. Let me do it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be the one. Yeah, and, uh, and two assignments and two commissions. Yeah. Uh, why do I do this to myself? And I thought, look, if there's a book that I don't want to read, it's this one. Because it looks drier than a really dry thing. Drier than the wastelands. Drier than a piece of toast in the wasteland. Drier than my wit. During the Great Butter Famine of 2057. So, you read this book, you are going to be driving the ship, I'm yes. going to be back in. your Wookiee co-pilot at the side. I've watched the film, I have opinions about the film, I think it's a bit shit, <laughs> uh, but I am going to uh, just butt in, ask questions, and I'm really going to go on the ride with, just like the audience is, and uh, hear some of this for the first time, and you're going to get my fresh out of the oven reactions to Disney black hole. So at first I'm a little cautious about it. I'm just going to poke around the rim of the hole. Uh, but I'm hoping by the end, I'm going to be right up in that hole <laughs> and uh, find out what it's all about. Crushed to death by its immense gravity. So who wrote this Courtney? Uh, well, I think pretty much everyone who listens to this show knows this name. Alan Dean Foster. A man so mighty that not a single, not 
two names. Two names couldn't contain his uh, uh, mightiness. Yes. Um, doing very well. Yes. <laughs> what are we even talking about? <laughs> Meanwhile, Alan Dean Foster's like, yeah, man, you're going to criticise... <laughs> you're going to criticise me, pal. You can barely string a couple of words together and you're going to complain about my writing. Talking verbally is hard, yo. Writing's easy. Writing's easy. You get to think about it. This is all off the cuff. This is coming straight off of my dome, Alan. So, Alan Dean Foster, friend of the show, has written quite a lot of crazy books, including Alien which was particularly crazy because he said, uh, is it about an alien or is it about a cat? I'm going <laughs> to hedge my bets and write about both, but mostly the cat. <laughs> so he's known for being quite a verbose writer. Oh boy, is he ever. Quite a sort of... I'm not saying like his personality as a person. I'm sure he's lovely as a person, but there's something very sort of pompous about his writing, I think. Mm. Something uh, sort of like puffed up chest, uh, big deep voice, and uh, droning on to the the crowds. Yes. So hopefully it will uh, live up to his legacy. Mm. Whew. I think we just got to get into this thing. Let, let's not wait any longer. Shall we read the beginning? Yeah, let's just get into it. All right. Let's go. You start. All right. No one would have expected at the beginning of the... No, that's the War of the Worlds. Uh, but imagine it in that kind of voice, because it is that pompous. So, the universe bubbled and seethed to overflowing paradox, as Harry Booth knew. And I'm done. <laughs> what does that sentence mean? I, I read it several times, that because I thought I wrote it wrong. Such an Alan Dean Foster opening <laughs> sentence. The universe bubbled and seethed to overflowing paradoxes. I got no idea what that's about. And uh, it doesn't entice me to keep reading. But we I have think to. it's saying it runs on weird shit. The universe is fucking bonkers, is it's what it should have well said. well bananas. <laughs> <laughs> the universe is well bananas, is, Harry Thor. Is that Brian Cox? Scratching his balls. The universe is mysterious. Yeah, no. <clears throat> so, <laughs> let's stay One, hey, let's, let's, let's keep going. One of the most ironic was that the mere observation of its wonders made a man feel older than his time when instead it should have made him feel young, filled with the desire for exploration. Take himself, for example. He, he was an inhabitant of the years euphemistically called Middle Age. That That's a long way to go to say he was in his, like, mid-30s. Yeah, this is Ernest Borgnine, just so you know. <laughs> Actually, he's not, he's not in his mid-30s, because, as we're about to find out, mentally the label meant nothing. His body felt as limber and as healthy as when he graduated from the university, though his mind had adopted the outlook of a wizened centenarian, a centenarian who had seen too much. So he's... that means he's like a hundred years old, right? Yes. Centenarian generally means a hundred or more. What if he was a centaurian and uh, his whole bottom half was a horse? Whoa, that actually makes something exciting in this film. We can't have too much excitement in this film. That was just the, the mandate of this film. You know the worst thing about being a uh, centaur? Uh, well, there's a lot of, of problems, but okay, go on. I, I think for gentlemen such as ourselves, I think that the tricky thing would be you've got an emasculating uh, Ken doll-like m uh, mound mm. in between your legs at the front. Yes. And your dick is like a metre and a half behind you. Yes. Weird. <laughs> Okay, so Ernest Borgnine, he was an inhabitant of the years euphemistically called Middle Age, which we assume in this universe then people live to 200. Now, considering what Ernest Borgnine looks at, uh, looks like at 100, <laughs> I, I reckon uh, t too much of a good thing. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's cut it off early. All right. Come on, Harry admonished himself. Cut it out. That's wishful thinking. You want to sound like the all-knowing old sage of space? Your problem is that you still have the perception as well as the physical sense of well-being of a university student. Imagine yourself the inheritor of the skills of Swift or Voltaire if you must, but you know darn well you'll never write anything that makes you worthy of sharpening the pencils of such giants. Be satisfied with what you are. A reasonably competent, very lucky journalist. Uh, let's not do the American accent. <laughs> I'll spare you from it. Okay. So, this almost feels now like Alan Dean Foster, even two paragraphs into this thing, is having a moment. 
Like, he started off with uh, a whole lot of sound and fury signifying nothing, <laughs> and then starts admonishing himself about his writing style. Like, who are you fooling? You're never going to be, like, one of those greats. <laughs> you should just uh, chicken scroll this thing. Go A to B, like uh, Da Vinci. <laughs> we still get paid the same amount. What am I doing? <laughs> uh, it continues. Lucky indeed, he reminded himself, half the reporters of Earth would have permanently relinquished the use of their 30 favourite invectives for a chance to travel with one of the deep space life search ships. How you, Harry Booth, ended up on the Palomino when far better men and women languished behind merely to report on the departure from Earth's orbit was a mystery for the muses. Count your lucky stars. Glancing out the port of the laboratory cabin, he tried to do just that. But there were far too many, and none that would unequivocally be deemed lucky. Although he had pleasant company in the room, he felt sad and lonely. Lonely because he had been away from home too long, sad because their mission had turned up nothing. And strap yourselves in for a lot more nothing, guys. Look, I just think, do any of our listeners, put your hand up, I don't care where you are, put your hand up if you know what this story is about so far and what's going on. Uh, it's, it's certainly been a long way to say an old journalist guy is on a spaceship disappointed in himself and the fact that they haven't found anything of interest. That, that's basically it, right? Yeah, and Harry is actually set up as our point of view character, but it doesn't remain that way, and he never is in the film. And I think that's something that both... Uh, film and book are missing. It's just a bunch of people you don't care about. The only way you can distinguish them is basically name tags or generic, or general, I should say, distinguishing features. Yeah, they don't have that. They even wear similar costumes. They mm. don't have that kind of charisma of the Star Wars group, for example. Or even go, the Star Trek uh, crew. You go, well, that's McCoy, that's Kirk, that's Spock. No confusing him. Yeah, really interesting set of personalities that uh, complement and have conflicts with each other. These mm. guys are all pretty bland. Um, so, yes, as I've said before, uh, Booth is played by Ernest Borgnine, and somehow this is what reporters look like in the year 2130 AD. Realistically, the reporter should be a teenager with a blog. Like Cyber Jimmy Olsen. Yes. And apparently he works for a newspaper and everything. How quaint. If anything, it should be someone reporting for a science journal, but this guy seems like he literally came from the Daily Bugle. Just listen to this. Booth reports, This expedition has concluded 18 months of extensive exploration and netted, as with all previous expeditions of a similar nature and purpose, nothing. Not a single alien civilization, not a vertebrate, nothing higher than a few inconsequential and unremarkable microbes. He completely dismisses microbial life. Do you realize how tremendous that discovery would be? The problem with microbial life is... You can't have sex with it. And I think mo we, if we learn anything from Captain Kirk, most voyages of Discovery <laughs> are about going around and trying different uh, alien vaginas. <laughs> well, and, and another ridiculous premise is that this ship was apparently just sent out to wander aimlessly through the universe. And they're actually surprised when they don't find anything. Are you telling me that these people don't have probes? Manned missions are the absolute last thing you do. I mean, compare this to Prometheus. As stupid as that film is... As it, beautiful as that film is. It's stupid, but that's the thing. I'm on the same page with you. It's a beautiful movie, and I love the cast. the haters! Uh, it, it's flawed. It is flawed. But, at least, they had a specific destination in mind. And also, like Prometheus, this takes place on Christmas Eve. We need reindeer and a fat man in a red suit. That would do for a report on extraterrestrial life, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, cringe. Leave out the space cookies. You notice as well, they're on the Palomino, right? That's the name of their ship. Yes. But that's a horse. It's a horse, or in Spanish, or at least traditional uh, usage of the word, it is to be compared to a dove, have dove-like qualities. I think this would be so much better if Ernest Borgnine and his pals were riding a space horse. That would be pretty cool. Through or space. Space centaur. Looking for alien holes. <laughs> what if he was a space centaur? Space hentai centaur. <laughs> hentai centaur <laughs> riding a space horse. <laughs> don't Photoshop that, guys. We don't want to see that. Please do. <laughs> yeah. Give him 16 boobs. <laughs> Uh, so, we have Durat, who is supposed to be the science officer, and yet he says bullshit like this. 
He replied more harshly than he intended, his tone sharpened by months of disappointment. Aliens are a myth for storymongers to tease and toy with us. They're a fiction. This trip has been proof enough of that. And, of course, well, now you've said it, I, I think what he really means is that they haven't found sexy aliens, because you can't shag microbes. This is uh, Anthony Perkins, by the way, if you want to get all these characters in your head. Mm. So, of uh, Psycho fame. Oh, yeah! Norman Bates. Uh, and he's quite creepy in this as well. Now, there's been rumours for a very long time. I, I think even uh, as recent as 2013, there's been a lot of talks about Disney remaking Black Hole. Mm. Which, uh, I don't know, I think the premise is interesting enough. That's the thing, when I was reading I'm going, oh, wouldn't it be cool if this happened, wouldn't it be cool if that happened, but they just steer so clear of anything that was interesting or challenging, just went for fairly cliche tropes. And there's a complete lack of, like, action and flair. Like, the action scenes are very, very brief and clunky. Somehow, it's actually more boring when action is happening. How do you fuck that up? Yeah, like, nothing looks choreographed or planned or is, is exciting. So I think that, in the right hands, maybe there is something here that uh, could, uh, you know, be worth seeing. The, the idea is that it would be directed by the guy who did Tron Legacy. Oh, cool, yeah. So let's... I want Tron 3. Why can't I have Tron 3? Well, because nobody wanted it. Well, they've been talking about it, and they're going, oh, no, yeah, no, yeah, no. Talk is cheap. Movies are expensive. Mm. So uh, we should, along the way, talk about perhaps if it was a straight, like, all these characters come back. Mm. I'm very curious as to which actors you would want in the roles. So have a think about that. Oh, I, yeah. Oh, if you caught me off guard here, I'd have to really think I've definitely it. got one for later, but uh, if you if you We can talk about it at the one, end, yeah. yeah. Now, when the audience all knows who we're talking about, because it's kind of useless otherwise. So who else is here? There is also Captain Dan Holland. And uh, played by Robert Forster. Yes. Who you may know from, I'm pretty sure he's the lead in Jackie Brown. Yeah, I think so. The name really rings a bell. But, oh, and there's also First Officer Charles Pizer. Pizer! Uh, played by Joseph Bottoms. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, whatever, you can forget about them because they're really insignificant in the grand scheme of things. But it should be noted that real astronauts are actually generally younger and fitter than these actors. Joseph Bottoms are uh, pretty fit. Yeah, he's, he's up there. But then the rest of the crew... Well, I guess Harry Booth gets a pass because he's not technically supposed to be an astronaut, but they probably wouldn't let someone like that up into space anyway because he's too much of a health risk. <laughs> he's only middle age. Um, <laughs> there, actually, you know, I will tell this story. It's not tangenting too much, but there was... This, I'll be the judge of that. Yeah, there's, there was a meeting between uh, the, the Russians and the Americans uh, you know, a few decades ago. Um, about their different uh, space technology and that stuff. And the Americans were saying, oh, yeah, here's this thing. Uh, you know, they had their first aid kit, and they basically had one of those, um, oh, God, the that thing. <laughs> the, the stethoscope? No, the, uh, the, the you know, charges and, you know, the oh, the the like oh, ele uh, the electric like and you put it on the chest and yeah. you go and you go what do you say you like clear don't you hate it when you have and then word it goes amnesia like, and then it goes like bzzz, like the cardio electric thing Thick thingamajigger yeah it's gonna come back to me later and be so totally embarrassed yeah, that my brain would not let me recall the that. heart zapper that one, that one of them thingamajigs anyway they had one of those that worked in space and the Russians went well we don't need this we sp just send healthy men into space. <laughs> Um, which, yeah, the, the, the standards are quite high. And the Americans said, have you seen what we eat? Yeah. Have, have you seen our restaurants? <laughs> Jesus Christ. And by restaurants, I mean things that have drive throughs All right. Now, look, there's a, don't keep me hanging, because I can see there's a woman here as well. <laughs> and finally, Dr. Kate McRae, uh, who has a chip in her brain that lets her communicate with robots telepathically. Better than a chip on her shoulder that makes her communicate uh, with robots antagonistically. <laughs> Uh, not only is that a totally useless ability, but it was also apparently uh, a really dangerous operation. One that had a high chance of leading to permanent brain damage. And based on a performance, I would not rule that out. <clears throat> and here's an excerpt. Uh, not every volunteer came out from under the operation. 
or sometimes one would emerge badly confused, sometimes permanently confused. Kate McRae's operation had been one of those that proved completely successful. Now, there's... I normally would ask at this point if she's hot, but uh, you haven't put her physical description. Is she hot? She looks like... Uh, mm, who can I compare her to? I thought... what Kath you... from Kath and Kim? Yes. <laughs> Look, they don't have to be global references. Something just for our Australian buddies All is right. fine. She's played by uh, a vet Mimio. Mm. Who, when I googled her, actually was quite a hot woman at one time. Yes. Uh, but that was before the gravitational pull of the black hole. Yeah, she uh, just sort of with the face. Looks like someone's mum. It's sort of weird. Tight blonde afro. Yes. <laughs> Not exactly Numi Rapace. So, um, so uh, yeah, so she's interested in Dan Holland, but is worried about how he feels about her. He knows this thing is inside me. Does he secretly regard me as some kind of mutated freak? Part human, part machine, part sex machine. Ow! And it's just an implant. Are you telling me no one else in the 22nd century has any artificial modifications? Where is the transhumanist future I was promised? Yeah, surely, like, um, Ernest... Borgnine at 100 years old has something like an <laughs> aluminium asshole or something like that. Why was he allowed into space? He's a centenarian. <laughs> but yeah, we, uh, I, I, on one hand, I, yeah, I'm probably being a bit mean, saying, oh, these people are too old and unattractive to be in a film. On the other hand, I guess it's actually kind of a nice thing to see diverse faces in a film that everyone's super hot and young and attractive and fit. Look... You're young and attractive. I feel like this is your time to, to be judgmental and just enjoy it. Just bask in it. Boo! All these old people, they're ruining all my fun. <laughs> oh, metal butt. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so Kay McRae uses that ESP ability to talk to Vincent. V I Vincent. Oh, it's the dumbest acronym. It is Virtual Intelligence Necessary Centralized. Oh, what if uh, in the remake, the Incent is played by Fitty Cent? <laughs> okay. Brilliant. Th there was nothing else to that. That was just that was it. All right. So he is a a robot who is perfectly capable of verbal communication or even talking via via radio. Um. He, so he's very intelligent, and he quotes a lot of uh, literature and stuff. He's a nerd. He is a nerd. <laughs> nerd bot. Yeah, so why do you need an ESP connection? I No, um, if the more I think about the aggro I get. So, Vincent is a uh, basically a dorky droid knockoff. You know, the kind of a combination of R2-D2, C-3PO, and Cartman, actually, if anything. Oh, wait till Bob comes on, the, the oh, beaten yeah. up version. He <laughs> totally looks like Cartman. He looks like he's wearing a beanie. Uh, he's, yeah, definitely yeah. Cartman out, looking at a picture of him now. Yeah, maybe we'll have to post that on the website. Just Old so Bob it. equals Cartman. Yes. Screw you guys, he's going home. Oh yeah, so Vincent is voiced by Roddy McDowell, and there seemed to have been a trend for robots back in the 70s or 80s to have a slightly effeminate voice, C3, C-3PO, Kit, all those sorts of characters. What's what's up with that? What are you implying, Hollywood? I'll, I'll tell you what, the one that doesn't is um, Tweaky from the Buck Rogers TV show. I never saw you that. You know, he's like the little um, midget boy robot with the page boy haircut. Okay. But he's got, and the woman in that is hot. She's wearing, like, um, jumpsuits and is all sexy. Mm. And Tweaky's kind of something dirty about him. He's voiced by Mel Blanc. <laughs> you know, his Bugs Bunny and stuff. Yeah. And he's almost got that kind of what's up, Doc, sort of thing. And he goes, like, um, bitty, 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 bitty. And he says, like, dirty things, like, bitty, 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 hey, lady, I want to touch your ass, kind of thing. He's just really uh... dirty. And, that's, and then the credits roll. Yeah, I think modern voices seem to be a bit more... Well, yeah, like Ultron or that robot in Interstellar. They've got those really cool voices. So they're kind of charismatic, if, if that describes Do it reckon simply enough. maybe it's sort of inspired a bit by 2001 as well, as that kind of calm, howl, yeah. calm, articulate, articulate sort of howl feeling to him as well. Yeah, I think modern robots do that, but then there's the camp robots in there as well. So, I don't know, someone else could analyse that more deeply than we are. There's probably some kind of subtext to be drawn from it. Anyway, 
the five-year mission uh, evidently is not as successful as that of the Enterprise. Uh, they're more successful than the, the reboot movies, right? Because don't, at like the end of the first movie, they're like, okay, now we're off on our mission. And then at the end of the second movie, they're like, okay, now we're really off on our mission. Okay, in the first film, you oh. have Vulcans and Romulans in the first act. So at least you see some aliens, at least some shit is happening. Okay, I, I buy it. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to try and put that genie back in the bottle. Also... Much more attractive to look at. Just the actors, the film itself, it's it's all very pretty and true. Very true, very true, very yeah. true. But now, okay, the, the yeah. Palomino... Yes, the, the Palomino is about to return to Earth when Vincent notices a large, swirling blue disc and recommends a course correction. Uh, Vincent identifies the disc as a black hole, the largest discovered in recent history. They also find a ship sitting on the edge of this black hole. They identify it as the Cygnus, a massive and expensive expedition that was headed by Dr. Hans Reinhardt that disappeared 20 years ago. Now... What does this remind you of? Because as soon as I heard this, I knew exactly what film this was. Uh, oh. This is Event Horizon. I've not seen that. Where the, seen... a big expensive ship disappears near uh, some sort of anomaly, and oh, then yeah. they go and find it. A crew go and find it floating through space and find that the inhabitants have gone crazy. Yeah. That is this film. Pretty much. Yeah. But not as cool. No. Even though Event Horizon is not. Perfect. But no one tears out their eyes in this, no, unfortunately. I kind of wish they did, though. This is so boring. <laughs> so, the uh, ship, the Cygnus, um, get down with the Cygnus. Uh, one of the crew members was Kate's father. Now, the way Foster writes the scenes where they're trying to identify the ship and attempt to board it are actually quite suspenseful. You think, oh, whoa, where, where is this going? What are they going to find? Where is the, fi- the scenes in the film? A doll. Despite the fact that it's uh, scored by John Barry, the music is so excited, but the screen is not. The music's great. That black <laughs> hole theme is fantastic and catchy, but it's really repetitive. Yeah, that they only have... It just keeps going on and on and on. Yeah. What I was hoping for was the reveal that this ship was merely an illusion caused by relativity. And I think most people know time slows down immensely near a black hole or anything with uh, immense gravity. So it is possible that from the Palomino's perspective, they are seeing a ship that had already entered the black hole years ago, but the light still remains. And then the Palomino would be lured into investigating the, investigating it, and then they would fall into the black hole, and then the real adventure would begin. But no, no, that would be too exciting. We can't have fun here. No, I look, I'm on board with this idea of the ghost ship sort of floating around the black hole. That's interesting. It's a haunted house in space. Let's go find out what's going on. Let's get to the bottom of this. I'm cool with that because they're still going to go into that black hole. You're not going to have a black hole movie without going into that black hole at some point. Well... Uh, you don't just dive into the black hole, Courtney. you gotta, you got to just uh, ease, Interstellar it up, did. ease it up first. Interstellar did. They go in there hella quick. Also, oh, can, can I let's share a little bit of trivia about Interstellar? That's hella cool. Okay. Okay. So I'll allow it. Now, Chris. You're no- driving. Yeah, Chris Nolan is, you know, say, pretentious. Pretentious. Say what you will about his films; they go on and on. And Overrated. On. He um, is. He's got quite an eye for detail, though, and he wanted the black hole to be as accurate as possible. So they were using all of Einstein's theories of general relativity, using all the calculations up to the moment that they had, and they were working with actual astrophysicists. Turns out that they had animated this black hole so well that a scientific paper was published on new findings that they had from this, you know, state-of-the-art Hollywood uh, uh, simulation of a black hole. I would have cast, saved some money, and cast Jim Carrey (laughs) as the black hole, doing his Ace Ventura, (laughs) and the black hole would go, can I ask you some questions? God, no. He's so good. All right, so um, you did the ship. I feel like we're, we're Reed Richards and you're Johnny Storm. Oh, sure. <laughs> uh, no response from the Cygnus. No, and the Palomino decides to dock inside of the Cygnus. It's like, oh, yeah, oh, that's it, dock inside me. Yeah, just imagine that scene from all the early episodes of Venture Brothers where uh, Brock Sampson is going inside the spaceship. Anyway, um, so the crew begin investigating. They encounter nothing but creepy robots. Now, some of those... Uh, robes, they look very humanoid and have mirrored face plates, kind of like uh, Cobra Commander. Which is very confusing at first, because you're thinking, that robot looks exactly like me. <laughs> 
Yeah, it's it's very effective. <laughs> that is until so yeah, they don't encounter anyone. That is until they enter the bridge. A ghost ship of robots and computers. Durant went on with this thing in charge. Surprisingly, the Colossus reacted to his statement. Their heads swiveled on the shoulders to stare at the speaker and the nervous reporter next to him. Not quite, Dr. Durant, a logical supposition given your situation and lack of true knowledge about what has occurred here. It talks after all, Booth mumbled. No, Holland was peering around the hovering mechanical. I'm sure that voice didn't come from this machine. Can I do his voice? <laughs> yes. Maximilian and my robots only run this ship the way I wish it to run. The voice went on. Holland walked around the monster, which did not move to intercept him. The others followed. The other, uh, <clears throat> they possess little in the way of programmed initiative beyond what I chose to bestow on them. Only I command the Cygnus. <laughs> so the big robot is Maximilian. Yes. He's a big red robot. Now, he is a really cool design. He's probably my favourite thing in the film. He's got an appropriate amount of menace. In fact, I do like all the robot designs. I would buy toys of these. Of course you would. (laughs) But, you know, the thing is, they fool you into thinking that the movie's better than it is because you see stuff and go, oh, that's interesting. I want to see how this all fits in, but uh, they're pretty bland in person. Mm. But yeah, let's talk about Hans Reinhardt, played by Maximilian Schell. Yeah, this is Dr. Bad Guy. I mean, Dr. Reinhardt. <laughs> uh, but it's just so abundantly obvious that he's the villain. I mean, uh, actually, yeah, show me the picture. He's got, like, the bad guy beard, and he's wearing, like, this military uniform that looks a bit fascist. So, yeah. He is the one that I've got to recast for. For the, I would like to see Jermaine Clement. Yes. Play Dr. Hans Reinhardt. I yeah. think he would have a ball. Yeah. <laughs> so he explains to the crew that he's the only one left aboard. The Cygnus was disabled by a meteor storm, and he and Frank McRae, um, Kate McRae's father, uh, they both stayed behind to repair, to do repairs, while the rest of the crew left the Cygnus in an attempt to reach home, although they were never seen again. Cowards. That's what happens to cowards. Yes. The Elder McRae had since passed on. Reinhardt admits that he refused to obey recall orders and has since dedicated his time to optimizing the ship for travel through the black hole as he's absolutely convinced that it would lead to another dimension. Yeah, he's the most interesting character in my mind because he actually has motivation. He's actually passionate about something. Yeah, he has character traits. He has motivation. Yeah. And you're like, yeah, like, if you don't go into that black hole, things are going to be pretty dull, so do it, dude. I'm totally behind him. Plus, he has cool robots doing everything for him. I think he's pretty rad. And I found myself asking, who is this aimed at? Throughout this film, it's quite slow and dull for kids. Hell, it's slow and dull for adults. Well, when you look at the trivia as well, I mean, not only did Disney spend a lot of money on making this film and marketing it, it was a very different film for Disney at this stage. It's the first Disney film, like live action film, to be aimed more at adults. Mm. They were trying to do something that was a little bit more serious and would have that kind of crossover appeal as some of those other big sci-fi movies. So it's the first Disney to have words like um, damn, and hell, I was going to say, ham. And Dell. <laughs> well, Dell didn't even exist yet. Don't steal my ham. Go and <laughs> dingle in your Dell. But yeah, because the Escape from Witch Mountain, all those ones, that was before this. I meant to look it up, but I think that's Yeah, before. and they're very much kids' films. Yeah. But I think the live-action Disney, they've always been really languid films. They've had that sort of pace which makes them feel like television films. I don't know if yeah. I'm thinking that just because most of them I would have seen on television as a kid on a, like a Sunday. Like it would, yeah, this feels like a Sunday afternoon movie. It's Yeah, with that kind of pace. But then you realise that $20 million was pretty massive at that <laughs> time. It's ridiculous. So it was in, intended to be a big release, but it certainly... Just like uh, Alan D. Foster was saying at the beginning, could not stand on the shoulders or sharpen the pencils of such giants as Star Wars and Alien or 2001. It's yeah. just not not anywhere in I would good. actually say this is older than those films, but it's not. <laughs> um, and yeah, so Tron, the first Tron, came out a little bit after this, and I think that's more... 
that's a tone that works well for Disney. It it does have all ages appeal. It's a little. I would bit say Tron old, suffers yeah. from the same thing. It's got good design, good ideas, but it's slow and cheap looking. Yeah. Um. I well, because I'm so nostalgic for it. But yeah, it, at least there is something more thrilling about it than the black hole but it does have a lot of pace, pace issues as well yeah but at least you have jeff bridges bruce box Lightner, all these really uh charismatic actors who doesn't love bruce box Lightner? oh my god he's so what, charming what Do not... teenage girl did not have a poster of bruce box Lightner on their wall in the uh 70s and 80s i know you're being sarcastic but my mom <laughs> is in love with bruce box Lightner. <laughs> well that just answered my question <laughs> So, there is a photo section. Look, we're, we're a little light on excerpts compared to normal, but um, considering what I know of this book, I think that's fantastic that mm. we're just kind of racing through. I'd rather discuss it with you than uh, yeah, the get too bogged down. 96 in pages, hardly anything happens. I summed it up in two pages, No, I'm not missing anything. That's true. We're really just into the, the very basic setup of the film. Uh, I do think that, in photos at least, uh, the movie looks quite good, which mm. I think sort of entirely as people to maybe foolishly see it again. The um, Cygnus here looks fantastic. Uh, the robot pictures are really cool. Now, my favourite part of the entire book is in the photo section and they're showing Maximilian and it says, The huge monster robot. He's one of the classic villains of all times. Frankenstein's monster. Dracula, Darth Vader, and now Maximilian. Even bring up Darth Vader. Keep dreaming, that, you guys. God, you guys had uh, a lot of optimism about this film. Nobody could pick Maximilian out of a lineup. Like, no kid today. There's <laughs> oh, no, yeah, no. There's no way. He's pretty cool, though. Like, if you put him on Robot Wars, you know that show from the 90s, I think? Yeah. Jeremy, Jeremy Clarkson hosted that. <laughs> um, yeah. So did... Uh, or was it a different show? But they, well, they franchised it. So there's, a, there's an Australian version, there's an American version. What well, was the one that was hosted by uh, Lister from Red Dwarf? Dwarf. 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 Uh, well, uh, that might have been the English one. It had robots fighting. Yeah. And, uh, All you need to know is robots were fighting. It was pretty rad. Yeah. Um, now, I am a huge science nerd, uh, which is probably evident in my you! previous episodes. Yes. Get out. Yes. <laughs> but you know what? Black holes, we still don't really know if they exist or not. Um, it, and the same thing with wormholes or even white holes. Um, it's all in the realm of theory at this point. So I actually can't pick apart this film too much. They are actually saying things that reflect either what we thought at the time or what we think of now as being the truth about black holes. Well, that's interesting you say that, because I, I did read a quote, and I'm going to paraphrase, because I don't have it here, but Neil deGrasse Tyson said it's one of the most scientifically inaccurate movies of all time, mm. and that if uh, things behaved how they actually would near a black hole, that it would be a far, far, far more exciting film. Oh, yeah. It is totally scientifically inaccurate on m a lot of other things, but when they actually get into discussion about a black hole, you can actually go, well, we don't actually yeah. know. But, oh, yeah, I could actually tear this thing to bits uh, on other premises. Although, yeah, the p so the Cygnus is sitting on the edge of a black hole, totally unaffected by the gravitational pull. Um, that's apparently... He, he's modified the shields using field theory so that he's impervious to gravitational effects, but then when it goes into the black hole, I just... Ah! Oh, yeah, no. But What, what, what about a remake starring Sam Wertho as Captain Dan Holland? Mm -hmm. And it's called Brown Hole. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so, Can uh, we have Neil deGrasse Tyson as Harry Booth? Sure. Yeah. The crew, uh, they're having dinner in this uh, picture with Wait, the who, chandelier. Who's the shitty science officer dude? Was that Holland? I can't I don't. See, I, I've read this. I've watched this. And there's so... It's Durant. Yeah. Bill Nye the science guy. <laughs> okay. So... Uh, the crew is then invited to dinner in Reinhardt's gaudy red dining room while Vince... It, seriously, though, it looks like something out of Doctor Who. It, it, it's really crap set dressing. Anyway, so... It's Vin got a chandelier! Oh, it's hell fancy if it's got a chandelier! <laughs> 
Meanwhile, Vincent hangs out in a robot shooting range. Uh, he goes up against Captain Star. Captain Star does look cool. He looks like he could be in Star Wars. Yeah, he was the uh, former chief badass bot before Max was created. And he's got, like, guns, which are like Star Lord's guns, with the barrel on the top and the bottom. It's a pretty cool design. Yeah. Now... You'd think a scene like this would be really cool. I mean, you've got robots shooting at shit. No, it's really dull and tedious. How do you screw that up? It's my favourite scene. Like, I perked up when that scene was on. I watched that scene. I was like, yeah, come on. And then, yeah. like, Bob's there as well. The Cartman Bob. Yeah, so um, this is where Vincent finally meets the floating pile of scrap called Bob. Cartman. Yes. Yeah, he's going to have that voice for this whole episode. So, um, yeah. He's actually got, like, a slow southern drawl. Yeah. Almost, um, what's the, the dog in Toy Story? A little bit like that. He's very racist. <laughs> yes. So, anyway, this is what the humans talk about. What truth are you pursuing inside the black hole, Doctor? She frowned at him. You seem to have something specific in mind. Does the bear actually have some idea of what he hopes to find on the other side of the mountain? Since when is that a metaphor people say? What does that mean? You don't know that song? No. The bear climbed over the mountain, the bear climbed over the mountain to see what he could see. But all that he could see, but all that he could see was the other side of the mountain, the other side of the mountain, the other side of the mountain was all that he could see. So it's about an adventurous bear, he climbs up wanting to see what's on the other side and he realises that all he can see is the other side of the mountain. So that was... Okay, that's it. That was... I'm from the 70s, dude. Um... I know all about this bear mountain business. <laughs> oh, right. No, I didn't know that because my it. generation grew up with Spice Girls and the Saddle Club. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> I know what he hopes to find inside that black hole. <laughs> candy! <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. It's full of candy. It's more like more of a piñata. <laughs> so, uh... You can do the voice, but I'll read this. Yeah. Reinhardt smiled back at her. Beyond the mountains, my dear, suspended in time is a new beginning. A universe that may be suspended in time, where a long-cherished laws of nature do not apply. You live by the laws of nature. What if these prove inhospitable? I can learn to master new ones. I am prepared to cope with whatever I may discover, especially if I find what I hope to find. Which is? Asked Durant expectantly. Eternal life. You know that time slows the nearer one travels to the core of the black hole. That seconds inside the event horizon can equal years on Earth. I see where you're leading, Doctor. McRae tried to give the fantastic theory dispassionate consideration. True, you could live 40 years in the hole while the millennium passes on Earth, but the 40 years will still only be 40 years to you. It would not extend your real lifetime. That is near the center of the hole, my dear. Once through the hole, I believe I may emerge into a universe indifferent to what we call normal time, where those 40 years will extend indefinitely. They may become 400 years, or 4,000. There may be no upper limit if the aging process is effectively arrested. Life forever. With no possibility of death? Doesn't that interest you? I find the prospect appalling! Reinhardt chose not to reply to that and regarded her with what seemed a certain sadness. Now, for one, like, how long do these people want to live? Borgnine is already a hundred years old. <laughs> His uh, shithole is made out of tin. Yeah, I mean, frankly, if I had a week, I couldn't explain all the reasons why that wouldn't work. I mean, if black holes do exist, and they function the way we suppose they do, and really did lead to another universe, which again is arguable, um, the fundamental physics of that world could be entirely different, and he would be instantly atomized. He seems to simultaneously understand and not understand the difference between general relativity and entropy. And how does he know if there'll be women there? Yeah. Or ice cream, or magazines, or, or you music. Mi you might be floating in a void, or at least something that seems to you like a void, because because your eyes were never actually made to see whatever... There might even not even be light. There might be different kinds of particles that you can detect. It might be full of prickly bushes and giant scorpions. He doesn't know. Cthulhu monsters. No, oh, it could be a glorious land of chocolate. Oh, it's, it's worth it to find out. What's it could on... be a giant mountain covered in curious bears. There could be bears <laughs> on the other side. It's so strange that my childhood just did not have such a, uh, such a, uh, what would you call them? Nursery rhymes? Yes. Do you want me to sing it again? I will. No. <laughs> so, 
This book is 187 pages long, and it's 118 before Reinhardt even declares his intentions to enter the goddamn black hole. Seriously, most of what we're telling you comes from the last 60 pages, though. It's so crammed in there. It's it's like 100 pages of nothing, and then, oh shit, we gotta get some plot in here. So it, I actually, it was a, it's quite hard to write notes for this, because miss a page, uh, you can skip through five pages at the beginning, miss a page towards the end, and you're totally lost. Classic Foster. <laughs> Spends so, the first hundred pages just running his finger around the hole. Yes. Afraid to go in. Um, the uh, Isn't that called a Pacific Rim job? I think that's, I what, think that's what it is, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, Good the, job, Del Toro. <laughs> <laughs> the crew was st uh, are, of course, starting to doubt Dr. Bad Guy's story and think he might be insane. In the membrane. Yes. But really, he's uh, dropping science like Galileo drops an orange. Um, yeah, yeah. This is made evident or evident when uh, Vincent and Bob are alone. Bob reveals a secret. Lasers flashed at regular intervals, and other devices functioned. All were conducted by the robed, face-plated shapes at the consoles. It was a compact symphony of remote surgery, advanced cybernetics, and complete moral desiccation. Those poor creatures are what's left of the original crew, Bob whispered as softly as he could. They are kept alive by a technique of Reinhardt's I don't pretend to understand. They are humans then? More robot than human now, Vincent. The old robot sounded forlorn. There was nothing a mere Bob unit like myself could have done. Reinhardt had constructed Maximilian as a therapeutic research project, or so he told the other humans. With his aid, he was able to take over the ship. He and Maximilian secretly reprogrammed the other robots to help him. They were not responsible. He'd altered their circuitry and memories radically. This altered programming did not manifest itself until the time he'd chosen for the takeover, when their secret special programming was keyed by a select phrase spoken by Reinhardt. Which was... Those humans who'd survived, you see what's left of them working around the ship. Occasionally, some die, despite the best efforts of Reinhardt's program surgeon. Some die from natural causes, I'm sure, but I believe others experience a flash of reality and kill themselves. That's, that's dark. That's some heavy shit, Disney. <laughs> yeah, so we don't get to find out what the phrase was. Yeah, no, we don't. I bet it was pineapple. <laughs> Stay puffed marshmallow, man. Yes. Because that won't come up in conversation ever. No. So, Vincent later recounts this story to Holland and Pi uh, Holland Pizer and Booth. Uh... We can't just take off and leave those poor devils behind. Pizer continued to eye the reporter. It looks like we'll have to try your plan and take over the Cygnus after all, Harry. It was uncomfortably cool in the reception area, but the reporter had suddenly began to sweat and risk ending up like the crew if they couldn't pull it off. What chance do we have? What about being heroes, Harry? Pizer was taunting him. Change your mind mighty fast. Lay off, Charlie. I didn't think we'd have to fight a setup like this. I didn't know Reinhardt had managed to overcome the whole crew. I thought they'd abandon ship like he told us. Taking on one man and one robot? Okay, but not a programmed army. Robots set to guard are one thing. Murder's another. Captain, Bob said gently. You would not be doing them a favor returning them to Earth. The damage to their minds is irreversible. From what I've been able to observe and comprehend of the surgical procedure, it's possible that their ability to respond individually might be restored, but they would be as mindless as newborn infants. Death is their only release. Yeah, seriously, this is some talk shit. <laughs> hundred odd uh, pages into this, I feel like death is our only release. Yes. <laughs> hey, you didn't even have to read it. Uh, fun fact, there are bloody fingerprint marks on some of the pages. I can't imagine why. Just like in Event Horizon, somebody trying to pull out their own eyes Probably. while uh, reading this. That's pretty creepy. Do you think it's a haunted book? I hope so. That would mean that at least something exciting came out of this. Oh, yeah. Look, take that down to forensics. Let's find out the uh, past victim who read this. <laughs> So, Holland orders Vincent to contact McCrae and tell her what's going on, and inform her that they are leaving with or without Durant, who has fallen under Reinhardt's spell. McCrae was standing before the vast screen on which the three-dimensional image of the black hole was being projected. The gravitational maelstrom teased her scientific self with its tongue. Uh, emotionally, it terrified her. Meanwhile, Durant strolled over to stand closer to Reinhardt. 
You've achieved all this on your own, Dr. Reinhardt. You have every right to reserve your coming expedition to yourself to reject the request of a Johnny come lately. That what does was, that mean? That was my nickname in high school. <laughs> in the quest of eternal youth, Alex, it was hard to tell if the commander was mocking him, but now Geraint was so far gone with worshipful admiration that he wouldn't have cared anyway. Scientific truth, Doctor. So, Anthony Perkins, he wants to go along. He wants to get in the hole with him. Mm-hmm. He's they, down for it. Yes. They want to DP that thing <laughs> as soon as possible. <laughs> Do you, they, he wants to Deadpool that? Yes, he wants to Deadpool uh, that hole. Okay. I don't know what that means. <laughs> so anyway, McRae tells Durant the truth about the robots, and he goes to prove this for himself. He straight up walks in, and Durant, now stood poised next to a humanoid, operating a portion of the complex, drive-to-direction instrumentation. I didn't understand what that meant. I, that sounds bullshit, but anyway. Sounds keep... made up. Still, the figure ignored him. Durant waved a hand over the reflective, parabolic face shield, waiting for the mechanical to object. It did not. He pulled the shield off. A face that had once been a human continued to take no notice of him, continued to stare only at the control that had been programmed to watch, Eyes that was the smaller version of the face mask itself, which well didn't have any eyes. Yeah, no, was, I didn't understand that either. It was just a mirror. Stared dully out at a barely perceived world. They hinted only at the void behind them. So, uh, obviously, maybe they didn't have the design available for Alan Dean Foster there because he does not describe what is under there at all. Yeah, it is literally... Uh, well, it, it is, it's scary as shit, first of all, especially for a kid. So, if kids are watching this... They're um, a bit zombie-ish, aren't they? Yeah. They're kind of hairless, sunken eyes. You can sort of see that skull kind of shape. Yeah, oh, what zombie movie? Oh, actually, yeah, they look a little bit like the ones from I Am Legend, if anything. Yeah, and you, I think that's the only clear shot of them as well. So it was yeah. designed to be something quite scary that uh, stuck with you that you didn't then suddenly see a billion times afterwards. Mm. Also, uh, immediately after that, Durant is blended to death by Maximilian. He uses his little, you know, twirly... Yeah, he's got these, like, little cutting, spinning blades that come out of his chest and uh, look like they would whisk up you cake mixes and things. Blend your protein powder with it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, they come out of his nips. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> Durant, for whatever inexplicable reason, attempts to defend himself with a ring-bound ring folder, which is quite pitiful. And again, who was the target audience for this? Yeah, it rips through the folder, and then you don't see it enter his chest, but you see Perkins screaming as his nipples are turned into <laughs> thinly sliced nipples. <laughs> or slipples, as I call them. <laughs> uh, so... Did they? Did the did the book? You don't have the excerpt for that. Did the book describe that in a terrifying a way? I, no, it didn't. It actually glossed over it. He's literally there and gone in a second. I was quite disappointed because I wanted to have something worth writing about, but it's almost have him minced. Yeah, no. It literally it happens, and then McRae and Reinhardt continue talking like nothing happened. But uh, after that, McCray is then sent to be lobotomized and turned into a cyborg. Uh, she's a woman in the 70s. She was uh, pretty much lobotomized and turned into a cyborg by the script to begin with. <laughs> by the patriarchy. At least she was no longer worried about screaming. She was too frightened. We're coming, Dr. Kate, a familiar voice said comfortingly inside her head. Vincent, hurry, please. She could not allow herself the luxury of lapsing into hysteria. That would foil ESP link communication. So it even stops working under certain psychological circumstances. That's great. Well, there's no reason for it. I mean, to be able to wirelessly communicate with a robot is something that everybody in the crew should be able to do and that you would take for granted. It would be a technology thing. Yeah, there's like those um, Jedi toys. The You put the little headset on and you can make the thing float. Uh, you know the one I'm talking about, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, we've got that. It's a children's toy now. Instead of this friggin' implant, unless you're Iron Man and you need to be able to call your armor to you, no reason. Well, the only reason is it just serves the plot. Like, it's only mm. here so that she can get the message out in order to be rescued. There's no other reason for her to be able to be the only one that can talk to the robot! <sighs> Uh, so anyway, Vincent relays that information to the rest of the crew, they go and rescue her, and then the next scenes are just boring hallway fights with robots. How could that be boring? But it is. 
<laughs> yeah, and as I said, the action in the film is incredibly clumsy and underbaked. And when the allotted time passes, the, the, the rest of the crew, you know, they m made this plan, basically. If we're not there in time, Booth, you can leave. So, Booth is eager to write off Holland and McRae as dead and leave. Paisa refuses, insisting on a rescue attempt. Uh, succumbing to cowardice, Booth feigns an injury so that Paisa will let him return to the ship. Booth then tries to take off in the Palomino alone, endangering the Cygnus and himself due to poor piloting skills, forcing Reinhardt to shoot him to prevent such damage. I would put an excerpt in, but literally, that's that it's glossed off, uh, glossed over. <laughs> Or as well. Glossing off! Glossing off. Um, no, it's just passed over um, as if it didn't even happen. So we're not even made to feel anything for these characters when they die, both in the film and in the book. And you... <laughs> I watched the movie and didn't even realise that Ernest Borgnine died. I must have nodded off during that bit. Yeah. Who directed this? How did you think that was a good way to do it? <sighs> Anyway, so Vincent and Holland and McRae now have only one means of escape, the probe ship aboard the Cygnus. Bafflingly, it has the power to resist the effects of the black hole, where the Cygnus struggles and begins to collapse. And uh, you could say, oh, because one is bigger than the other, but yeah, yeah, that doesn't, no, that doesn't work that way. So Reinhardt is trapped, uh, later, trapped under a fallen screen because the ship's falling to pieces, and of course none of his robots are capable of assisting him because he didn't program them with that kind of thing. This is like a guy setting up the first big plasma screen in the living room and it just falls on top of him. He's sort of laying with his head sticking out from under it going, help me, like a really weird death. Yeah, it's kind of pathetic. So Max is busy trying to stop the Palomino crew trying to escape via the probe ship and the lamest robot battle ever ensues against Vincent and Maximilian. I want Robot Wars, damn it! How do you fail so terribly at this? To be fair, the propellers that come out of the nips are pretty Robot Wars. They're you cool. know, they always but have that sort of But then I wanted, like, you know, a, a sword come out of, of Vincent, and they could really just fuck each other up. Yeah. <laughs> now, Bob dies, or whatever, screw him, just get in the goddamn probe. There's no question about it, Captain. Vincent had settled back from the console in his own efforts to influence their course. The ship had been pre-programmed. I don't have the necessary information to override. Only two individuals might. Reinhardt and Maximilian. McRae was surprised at how fast it resigned herself to the inevitable. At least their end should be quick. We're locked in then? Paisa leaned back in his chair. Holland nodded in agreement. Navigation is sealed, probably in case the pilot is incapacitated to hold the ship on course. Reinhardt was determined to make his journey, even if unconscious. <laughs> so we're going into the black hole after all, in spite of everything. Holland glanced over at his first officer, his friend. Check. Now that their destination was unavoidable, McCrave found herself speaking quite calmly. Let's pray that he is the prophet he claimed to be. And believe it or not, we are actually on the final page. This is so strange because all of my questions when watching the film, like one, th this last sort of 10 minutes of the book has just bored the shit out of me. Mm. Like, I'm getting frustrated with the story now. It's one of those things where I started with enthusiasm, and now I'm like, come on, Black Hole, come on, get into gear. Now you feel like I do. Now it turns out we're at the last page, which is weird because the, the ending of the film is incredibly trippy, weird, oh, yeah, yeah. open Set, wait to it. interpretation. We'll read this, and then we will go. And then we'll talk about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, because I was hoping this would shed some light. Uh, so... Should I, should I just read this? Um, actually, I, there's on this page... Well, that's quite a bit, though. No, just... From uh, here? Uh, yeah. Kate? Yeah. Kate! And she responded, You must join with me, Dan, and you, Charlie, and Vincent. If you can, Vincent, only thoughts have a chance inside here. Physical materialities will be crushed down to nothing. But thought, the essences of ourselves, I think we have a chance that way. Holland could feel something warm and all-encompassing reaching out to envelop him. A big space fanny. The fragmentation of himself that had been halted. He remained he. Just uh, feel free to interrupt with any questions or, or clarifications. Uh. It's working, came the powerful thought. It's the ESP link, my thought projection ability. It will keep us together if we fight for it. They blended, flowed together. Thought itself strained beyond its normal borders under the unimaginable force of the collapsar. I don't know what the collapsar is. Uh. 
Then they were through and amazingly still whole. Kate was Kate, Charlie Charlie and Dan Holland still Dan Holland. Even Vincent was there. They were themselves and yet something strange and new, a galactic sea change that produced all the above and a new unified mind thing that was Kate, Charlie, Dan, Vincent also. <laughs> Dimly, they it perceived the final annihilation of a minuscule agglutina- agglutination. Agglutination? Is that even a word, Alan Dean Foster? Agglutination of refined masses, the Palomino. It was gone, lost in an infinite brightness. They it remained content and Can we call infinite them group now. now. <laughs> They're together now. They're, we are group. They're group. As the white hole itself. They had been compressed, compacted, but had passed beyond and true with their cells still intact. With the passage came peace and time to contemplate. On a beach was a grain of sand. The sand was part of a continent, the continent component of a world. The world a speck of substance in the sea of infinity. They were part of that world, part of every world, for in passing out the white hole, their substance had become dispersed. An atom of Charlie to a nine-world system, a molecule of Kate to a local cluster of stars, a tiny diffuse section of Holland, his balls, spread thinly over a dozen galaxies. Yet they could still think, for thought does not respect the trifling limitations of time and space, they were still them and this new thing they had become. Their thoughts spanned infinity, as did their finely spread substance, and they now had an eternity in which to contemplate the universe they had become. Fuck you, black hole! Uh, the only time I've ever thrown a book across a room oh. was uh, the last Harry Potter book. Oh. But no, that definitely deserved it. <laughs> what an ending. Now It's the- not even an ending. It's like the in the film, that's probably ten minutes from the end. So I don't know if they just added that ten minutes late in production. In the film... Reinhardt goes to hell. Literal hell. Like, there's fire and brimstone. and yeah. he- So it turns out that Reinhardt and Max survive somehow, and they're floating out in space in this other universe, and they're not dead somehow. And they actually form this symbiotic relationship, become one entity, a robot man thing. Because Maximilian, ha- Ma- Maximilian has that visor yeah. on his helmet. Like and a then, Cylon. Visor. And then suddenly Max's eyes are looking out through the helmet. Reinhardt's eyes. Are looking Reinhardt's through. eyes. Yeah, I know. Played by Maximilian. Yeah, it's confusing. So confusing. And he's... Wait, Maximilian Shell is the guy who plays Reinhardt, and now he's in Maximilian Shell. Yes, and he's standing in the crazy big robot in this big landscape shot, surveying hell. Yeah. And it's amazing. Like, it's the best shot in the film. It's yeah. Maximilian with the evil bad guy inside him surveying hell. It's ridiculous. There are references to hell at the beginning of the film. Not so much in the book, so I couldn't use much excerpts there. But, yeah. What the hell? Literally. And it, it doesn't even feel like he's being punished or defeated necessarily. I feel like he's the king of this new hell ro- realm yeah. when I'm watching the film. Yeah. But then suddenly you see like all these white arches yeah. and these like angel, translucent angel figures. Yeah. Are they just angels or are they the crew? I, I wasn't sure about that either. Uh, and so everything's bright and white, and these angels are flying down a corridor, but then you never see them again. And what what happened to McRae, Holland, and Vincent? Well, apparently, so what we just read there, which didn't make a lot of sense, is that McRae's ESP link somehow allowed them all to join together, but not physically. They ascend into this unified thought entity, kind of 2001 a Space Odyssey style, which, well, in the film, that contradicts the fact that somehow Reinhardt and Max could do that. Uh, anyway. Like, how do we interpret it? Did they just all die? And they've gone to heaven and hell. Is this the end of Lost? Is this Lost? Ah. Oh. I yeah, don't know what happened. Because a very simple Judeo-Christian imagery and all that, it's just so juvenile. Is that really... They either died or they've actually gone through a portal to hell like an Event Horizon. Uh, it is Event Horizon. It is literally Event Horizon. It's horror. Disney's Event Horizon. Yes. So people are talking about remaking Black Hole already being done. <laughs> what about Disney does Event Horizon as an animated musical? Yes. 
I would love that. It would be kind of repo the genetic opera. Submit yes. the lyrics of the songs to our Facebook page. I, I feel like... Uh, I need a musical with scientific language in it. I think that would be amazing. I, I feel like after a strong start, Courtney, we've just wound ourselves up into, into a very confused mess at the end here. I, I just don't know where to go from here. That's uh, it's a really disappointing film. Yes, was the book better? Ah, uh, no. No. I'm going to say no, because I didn't enjoy what I read, and at least I got to see some cool robots and Cartman and <laughs> Hell Robot. Which yeah, I, I kind of Hell liked. Robot. Oh, can King, we make, King we, Hell Robot. Can we make a movie called King Hell Robot? Yeah, I think that would be the sequel, where Jermaine Clement is a King Hell Robot. Yes. And Because uh, that was the thing. I almost felt that it was setting up for a sequel, but then... The others were in heaven, and uh, I didn't know what was going on. There is that cliche in films, especially back in the day before te- technology was at that point where crazy outlandish concepts are easier to visualise. But, um, yeah, that thing of you don't see the monster till the end of the third act. You don't see... Or, or if there's some, yeah, like a black hole, some destination they're trying to get to, you don't get there till the final ten minutes. But I... the Well, everything I'd heard about the black hole, I thought they were going to spend all their time on the other side. It's disappointing. It certainly is. I feel like I fell asleep somewhere halfway through and now I can't wake up. Is this a dream? Are we in another dimension? I think we've astrally projected into the negative zone. Into the brown hole. I think it's because I read Marvel comics that I'm so assuming, oh, we're going to end up in the negative zone, there's going to be a Nihilus, and I'm just waiting for these really outlandish concepts. Ugh, you know what would have been better than um, nothing? Something? Something. Yeah. So the movie is only marginally better. Yes. So, uh, and I, I went on Amazon. Surprisingly, there are a lot of reviews. There's about 40 reviews, but uh, I don't know what happened. Maybe I felt like I was in another dimension because all these people seem sane and literate. And uh, they had actually quite intelligent critiques of the film and about what a disappointment it was and, and why it didn't work. Uh, so I guess that makes sense because I can't imagine many of the people that normally uh, write those reviews learning words like... Uh, I was reaching for the book, forgetting that I threw it across the room. No, you don't pick uh, that up. That what, is where it belongs. What was that book? A, a, what was that word? A, 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 a gluttonous, a gluttonous, a oh. gluttonous, something. A uh, gluten free yes. Anyway, uh, this was the only little sentence I liked. I didn't realize this was a film novelization when I picked it up, but I did read. It did read cinematically. So, the uh, cover. by which uh, she meant that she talked all the way through it and ate popcorn. Yeah, now a spectacular motion picture from Walt Disney Productions. So, uh, and it says this screenplay is, you know, by someone or other. So, yeah, obviously a novelization. You Can't believe silly you person. picked the book up. Uh, the word was agglutination. Agglutination. Yes, that's, uh, it's harsh. They're in a brand new nation, an agglutination. So, yeah, I think, um, well, Neil deGrasse Tyson is right. This is one of those cases where using actual science would actually, uh, inform the story and propel it and push it into these new interesting areas, whereas... What we got just... I mean, I, I keep thinking about how do you make it so dull? What, there, no, there's no joy in this film. Just none. Nothing to enjoy about it. <laughs> I think, fuck this shit, watch Star Wars or Barbarella. Yeah. So... Oh, were well, you going to recast the whole cast or... Should... No, I don't give no. a fuck anymore. No, who cares? You, you started out with so much um, passion and, and enthusiasm. I'm but... a broken man. Yeah, no, that's how I feel. I was watching and going, oh, it's like the new kid, and I'm, at, you know, at the end of my high school career, and, uh, yeah, no. <laughs> so, I'm going to pull a plug on this thing. Uh, thank you very much for listening, everybody. Please listen to our other shows. Go to fruitlesspursuits.com to find out everything we're doing. Links to iTunes, rate, review, links to Facebook, like us. Join our Facebook discussion. We're talking about all sorts of fun things like female Ghostbusters and all sorts of... Uh, Pop culture gubbins. Is Slimer gonna be in it? Is Slimer gonna be in it, and will he have boobs? Although, if, yeah, if they're using the same firehouse, then yeah, it would be the same Slimer. Yeah. Not the same continuity. 
Oh, so this is actually a different universe. I think so. This is not 616. This is like something else. This is something else. Uh, So, yeah, thanks for all that. Uh, Check out all the things and the stuff. Next week will be a whole new book was better. I I was going to announce what it is, but I can't remember. It is... I think it's Lassie. Well, Lassie is in front of me right now, so... Chances are? It might actually be. I think it's Lassie. You'll find out. It'll be a surprise. It's got to be better than this, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and if you uh, made it through this episode, let us know, and uh, you will send you a cookie. Yes. <laughs> we'll I'm send, sorry. We'll send you some space piñata candy. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so thank you, and uh, maybe we should reverse this because you drove. Catch you on the flips. Jumanji. Jumanji.